All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining for this semester's uh, first seminar of changing electric energy systems. Um, I'm Daniel, grad student at MIT. Um, thank you to Yangwen for joining us for the seminar. Um, he received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from CMU. Uh, upon graduation, he's currently or he was at Stanford University as a postdoc fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy and is currently an assistant professor uh, in the School of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering at Arizona State University. Um, Yang, the floor is yours to present. Thank you, Daniel. I would like to thank for the opportunity yeah, to talk at this um, webinar. Today, I'm going to it, it discuss Assured AI for distribution systems based on my 10 years experience at um, CMU, Stanford, and uh, Arizona State. Um, one observation we made with many utilities is they are new components. They definitely want to be changed so that they are facing new challenges and also get new revenues. From the utilities view and also you know, the field engineers view, they feel increasing changes on the generations and loads. For example, they discuss about um, how to do the modeling is quite different than the past. Yeah, sometimes they even have trouble to understand the new behavior because of the data resolution. Second, um, from system view, you not only have the nodes generation, I mean, I mean, consumptions, you also have the network that were connecting them for the past 30, you know, 50 years. This is the energy network part. You know, typically we need to do the planning so that we have system upgrades for the lines and for the devices around in that place. So there's a big concern here too. Other than that, um, these are the network that we can see as power engineers, but they are more coming from the customer levels that we don't see. This is what, um, an engineers called the behind the meter. And they are um, policy makers who want to get visibility into the households. I will talk about that. But in general, it is very hard to understand how these components are going to behave uh, without much knowledge into the household level. Finally, the, there, there is a new market. Um, this is because, you know, have the new devices, have new communication capability, have real time, I mean, maybe discussion on the internet. So people talk about transactive energy. I remember there's a big core from Stanford. Uh, we just decide how to send energy from one place to the other. And then the power engineers like me will take over the job and make sure this is feasible. But you know, it's very hard. So the challenges I'm making here is in the past, we have TSO and DSO. We still have these two components. However, there's intermittent generations yeah, coming from these massive um, secondary distribution grid popping up to the primary and all the way to the transmission. They are also less inertious. If we are um, focusing on these renewable generations that is shown on this picture, less inertia is a big concern to maintain the frequency and other services. Other than that, I have a project with utility partners. They have one-way transformers. So when they are two ways, they are very much afraid it will blow up the transformer. So this is a big concern. They ask me which transformer to be upgraded first and which to be the second. But you know, two-way flow is definitely going to be a phenomenon um, coupled here and there. Third, when we do not have visibility into the household level, then how can we do the control? Of course, we can do traditional control, but can we do some refined control with more intermittent generation coming from the household level? And finally, when we are building a new market for new revenues um, to have a better system, uh, then we should make sure transactive energy will be feasible all the time if we decided that's the roadmap to go. If we do not do maybe innovations about new technology, of course we are doing that. We do, do have a smart grid, but this is what I want to say. If we do not do much, then people already face different um, and troubles, for example, energy experts find out that our grid was not designed to accommodate high level of renewable penetration. We can upgrade, but you know, it's just not aligned well with what we planned in the past. And modernization, different experts have different views how to modernize, which part to modernize first. So this is some topic that we need to continue the discussion. Other than that, people already find outages to be more in some regions. 
So increasing reliability at least observed here from several regions in the world. And mm -hmm. when we talk about um, trying to use new technology like AI and data to do the job, to make a better grid, you also had a concern. Maybe you will steal my information, like pri privacy. Maybe you will make my grid to be less reliable. So there are also other you know, concerns about summer blackout to be more. This is why people say when we try new technology, we need to be careful. For here, um, we, I mean, as a power engineer, we were instructed AI is something we definitely want to try. But and the big concern is, is it ready for critical infrastructure? For example, sometimes we see videos on YouTube, you know, some of the cars highly intelligent, but maybe it's not that safe. And sometimes we have very nice Python code into a robot. And however, occasionally it may have some maybe outages yeah, by the definition of power system yeah, terminologies. The question is again, how can we yeah, include the new technology, but try to avoid such a concern as much as possible? So this is my view, and I'm open to discussion at any time. Uh, in my approach, I first try to collect the data so that I see what is happening. Yeah, for example, this is a data from Pennsylvania. This is a data from Phoenix region. We have um, hundreds of K of customer data, intellectual interrupter. We have the relay data. We have you know, the topology sensor data. We, you know, I try to see the data so I see the trouble and see how we can use the data to mitigate troubles in monitoring, control, security, and protection. Second, we what is needed in the field I design uh, assured AI assured means I have some confidence, I have some metrics to quantify that. However, a very important part is I do big data mining to discover what is the assure, what's the meaning of assurance because of the scale of power systems. Second, there are people talking about physics guided, but you know, physics guided in what sense? There are so many physical laws. How can we include assurance in physics guided learning? Third, performance guarantees. There are so many bonds that we can derive, but which one is tied and which one is right for power? After my data collection and design machine learning algorithms, I always plug in to close the loop. Yeah, this is what Maria taught me in the past, close the loop. So I have hardware in the loop validation, which is to do online learning, to do the validation with hardware to see whether the clocks are synchronized, whether there's any message that are miscommunicate. And finally, I deploy the algorithms with my partners like Apri into the field. So the software is commercialized. Finally, as I dig more about data-driven analysis, I feel there's a lake of policy in the distribution system. So I try to collaborate as much as possible in my career. And now I'm going to make you an example so that you can see what I mean for the five steps. Here, you can see on the left-hand side, this is Carnegie Mellon University, and you can see we have the data at different spots. This is the campus. In the past, we um, we typically don't care what, what are the connections. I mean, we don't need real-time tracking of that. This is because um, the network was passive. If there's an outage at some places, I can always send the engineer maybe two days later to repair the network and reconnect. But nowadays, there are solar panels. Yeah, for example, at Pittsburgh, I can see five to 10% of the households have solar panels now. These solar panels is creating the residential houses into a mini generator. So now I may be the generator to your house, house next to me. You may be the generator to another guy um, in the neighborhood. So this can cause I mean, cascading outages, which is something in large scale. So this is why today utilities has a key need to understand maybe roughly what is the flow there, which transformer maybe yeah, blowed up and due to increasing demand. But you know, when we look into the data or topology, it's very hard. This is because in big cities like New York, like San Francisco, and even for most of the part of Pittsburgh, and you can see this underground cabling part. If we really want to understand what, what is happening, occasionally we need to dig out the cable and see the real connection. But you know, this is really burdensome. This is a yeah, transformer that is underground too, like which household is connected to which transformer. So then we can we try to pay nothing 
right? We just use the data collected anyway to infer what are the topologies in the network so that the utility is happy with no additional cost but sealing the power flow in the distribution system. Personally, I define such a problem as giving the sensor data coming from the smart meter, you know, you have smart meter, some of them are collecting the voltage and power simultaneously. Sometimes utility just want the power and to send the bill. And sometimes you do have a meter, but it's not communicating due to maybe um, sensor failure is 100 bucks. So it's not a super robust sensor. The goal of my work is to infer what are the physical connections. You can see over here, we have different colors. Also, what is the inference that you can go to some places that you do not have a sensor that is working? So these are the empty white boxes, uh, white circles. In the end, I make a product that you can see on the right-hand side. Um, now I'm going to talk about my method, but you know there are so many experts working in this field already here. I want to give you a review what what they did and what is my view. So typically, when we have a machine learning method, we try. We just try to see whether it's working, whether there's amazing performance or not. So that is approach number one. We can definitely just try the black box machine learning approximation to see um, how some quantities are mapped to other quantities, like voltages to power. The second one is we wait. We do some investment. For example, I was working with Eaton. Right? We try to get new sensors into the field with some revenues, and the utility is happy that they can see the power flow equation exactly. The third approach is um, let's do not use black box. Seems to be unreliable. Also, let's do not wait. Can we do some, I mean, synergy of work that is letting the two methods coming together. One is the estimation accuracy, which is very good for black box method and relatively bad for generalizability. The other is yeah, good for generalizability because you have the rule. But can we do something like the black stars here? So this idea is typically input it into a serious design. What is the serious design? Uh, we try to use our domain knowledge. Like when we look into the power flow equation here, we know this is like a um, polynomial function of some voltages, quadratic functions. We have the sinusoidal function on sine and cosine. And we know roughly what the functionals look like. And then we try to do a serious design to superpose deep learning method, support work machine method, even random forest so that we have a output. The trouble for this method is maybe I have my design one and another expert has a design two. So which one is better? Um, it's hard to prove numerically or yes, theoretically. So this is why in this talk, I would like to propose um, some collaborative competing framework. When we have the power data input and output, and we try to learn maybe the relationship regression classification, uh, we can let machine learning methods to be in parallel structure to the physical embedding methods. So what does that mean? Deep learning is very good at universal approximation, but relatively poor for generalizability. Our physical understanding has the physics for generalization consistency, but we need to wait for full system information. If we ask them to compete, right? Whenever we can understand the physics, please, physics embedding, yeah, step forward and do your job. When we do not see much of the physics correlation, the deep neural network, please try to step up to do the job. So this is what I called meta learning to fuse the two. Um, coming to the basics of power flow analysis, suppose we have the power flow equation. So power is a summation of different flows. Power injection is a summation of different flows. And we look into the topology, which is unknown according to my in discussion initially at Carnegie Mellon University, our goal is to learn the blue parts. So put the blue parts over here. Everything else, like the voltage, maybe is measured by the system. The power for bidding purpose is there. So this is the data. Power injection at different places. And then voltages, let's assume for now, we know them. right? We know the voltage magnitude, phase angle. And then the only thing that we don't know and we want to learn is the beta here, which covers the topology and also the parameter. And you can see this is linear. That's very good, good news. But the trouble is, do we really know the theta, like phase angle? Do we have micro PMU everywhere? Probably not. And do we have voltages all the time? Utilities sometimes doesn't, yeah, do not care about voltages because for building purposes, it's only P. 
So that is why I want to talk about yeah, my approach. I propose to learn the virtual power flow equation in the secondary distribution system by a structure called deep learning tree. The idea is in the following. When you have the white circle, when, when I have a white circle here, I have no measurements. When I have some darker colors, then I have more measurements. Then I can define three types of node. One type of node is the blue one over here. You can see here, I have the P, I also have the voltages in the neighborhood. So that means I can infer the G and B in these three paths on the left, on the right, and yeah, below the node. On the other hand, there may be some boundary nodes, like let's say my neighbor, a new neighbor who moved to my yeah, neighborhood doesn't have the communication network working. He, he has a smart meter, but there's no communication. I also have a connection to you, yeah, my old neighbor in the past. Then when I do the physical learning based on these nodes, I always have something unknown from here. How do you quantify that? Because I don't, don't have the voltage here. So this is called a boundary node, which is in the boundary set B. And finally, you know, as we always want to understand what is not recovered, like in the unobservable region, I also define some nodes. Yeah, that is the unknown node set, which is the U. The interesting part is the power flow equation originally, if you or if I assume that we know the P, we know the V theta, the only thing is beta that is unknown. But now because of the voltages that are not known everywhere, then this power flow equation is naturally decomposed into two parts. Part one, yeah, the, the observable part and the boundary part, we can try to infer what is the beta that is over here, which is the G and B for power system terminology. On the other hand, we don't have the parts here, but we also don't have the parameter then can we do something intelligent? The black box method comes over because of the correlation in the local region for power system, the voltage will be similar in the neighborhood. Of course, I know it's not true in general, but that is the approximation. We try to borrow the voltages in the observable part, and then we assume there's a black box who is doing the universal approximation of the flow coming from the white circle to the blue circle. And then we ask the two to decide how to yeah, split the shear so they can jointly decide what is the perfect relationship of the power injection on the boundary and also the voltages that you can see. Here, I would like to give you an example of how the physics part and the approximation work together. So let's say this is a network um, because I, I, I know the network, so I assume I know the structure completely. But for power engineers who is running some algorithm to learn the flow, he only has the blue parts. For the blue part, if you focus on any other nodes like 17, 18, and you can learn the G and B by linear regression with a lasso method, that's easy. But the troublesome part is the boundary part. But no worry, the boundary part P5 is only dependent on the voltage at bus number five and the voltage at bus number four. If you buy that idea, I can quickly you know, condense the relationship here. I don't need to worry about the rest. And they should learn by themselves. On the other hand, um, for here, Power system, we have many reduction rules, like how we convert a big system into maybe a three bus system, a equivalent circuit. So then we can do a similar job to convert all of these unobservable nodes into a single node. So this will represent the flow coming from a super node, six prime, into the boundary node, which is five, and I'll put the summation here. What is the power injection code here? The flow from left hand side and the flow from the right hand side. So this is how I write the competition between the physical part and the approximation part to be P45 flow from bus four to five and P65 flow from six prime to five. For here, the interesting observation that I would like to yeah, comment a bit is the physics in this framework is helping the calibration. Yeah, for example, if I know I can take over more of the physical yeah, flow here, then approximation will be smaller. On the other hand, if the approximation is feeling that he can feed the data quite well, then maybe the physical part is not doing a good job. So this is like a free calibration for this comp competitive um, collaboration framework. Over here, this is mathematical elaboration. This is local information, P5, V5, V4. And you can see based on the observability, then you can decompose this multiplication and summation into two parts. One is the H physical part, HP. The other is the virtual part, H, virtual. You may wonder, Yang, if 
deep neural network can do the job, why do you want to spend such a such a time to do complicated combination? This is because nowadays we see that we need to achieve some goals, yeah, like a renewable penetration growing all the time. If that is the case, then the operating points, let's say two years later at Phoenix, Arizona, is going to be something different, like the voltage, maybe distribution at different buses at Phoenix region. Then how can we learn for tomorrow? So that is why I want to maximize the generalizability to learn the beta as much as possible. But here to quantify the two terms, the old term, which is always our engineering principle number one, minimizing the error. So I define the optional P to be P minus F V comma theta. So this is just to say, hey, no matter which guy is going to do the approximation, please make the arrow to be small. So that's number one. Number two, for the future, in order to have a good regularization, please also make the beta as correct as possible. Of course, we know we don't know the ground truth, but that's magic for learning. We let them compete. So they tell us whether they feel comfortable or not. This is um, the framework. For the framework, um, I said I want to propose a twin structure. For the twin structure is in the following way. Um, first, you have the voltages. I have the voltages V theta on the left-hand side. Maybe I don't have theta, but don't worry for now. On the right-hand side, if I have the power measurements um, from the meters, um, that's great. If I have the Q, that's even better. But my goal is to learn the mapping rule from V theta to PQ. Naturally, if I have all the V theta and PQ, I can learn the GB uh, accurately. How do I do that? I try to do a symbolic regression. I try to put some prior knowledge about V1 square, V1, VK, VI, VK, and sign there. And then this like a passing through gate is going to do the linear summation of all the symbols I have. So naturally I can learn the GMB. However, you know, we may not have the theta, we may not have the Q. So then we also allow deep neural network to do the second parallel pass, which is a black box method. We put, we put the V theta, whatever we have on the left-hand side, we let the deep neural network to learn the relationship, nonlinear relationship. And then my assumption is um, by minimizing this arrow, like mismatch, then I can achieve a good goal based on the assumption deep neural network can do the universal approximation. One thing I want to highlight before I move to the second part of the algorithm is there's an assumption. As a power engineer, many of my students practice deep neural network all the time, but sometimes it's not working. They just feel they didn't code good enough, but there's a condition for deep neural network to work well which is there exists a function f to perfectly fit the data. What does that mean? If I have a voltage at MIT and I have a power at Phoenix, Arizona, I, I say, try to do the universal approximation. But you know, these two may be uncorrelated in <laughs> most of the time, right? So that means at, at the beginning, I asked the, the, the agent to do the universal approximation, but it's a job that is impossible. So that is what I want to highlight, the second contribution. I not only ask them to compete and collaborate, I also quantify what is impossible so that we don't blindly trust the AI agent for any task we have. For the rest of the slides, I will you know, try to make easy notations, like a V theta represented by V, PQ represented by P. Before we go there, uh, let's first look into the relatively small network. With, with strong correlation. So this is a ground truth. If this is a ground truth, if we do not have a good model, you know, for example, we have some bias in the learning, that this may be the topology that we learned. So this is incorrect. And it's hard to justify or hard to verify whether this is wrong or not because it's an overfitting program. On the other hand, yeah, my method, uh, I propose, I, I show you, this is identifying the correct um, topology, but I want to tell you why. Number one, and the arrow looks to be smaller um, in both cases when we are looking into maybe the fully observable part and partial observable part. But the magic is when you have the fully observable part, I'm in your view, I know it. But for the AI agent, it learned it naturally. If you look into here, the physical part dominates. For example, for the power, how much is coming from HP? Most of it. The HV, which is the virtual approximation by the AI agent, he knows this is not his playground. He step out, right? The physical part dominate. 
And then that's good news because that means we have good generalizability for all future oper operating points in Phoenix. On the other hand, for this part, you know, the flow is coming from an observable node with meter and also coming from some neighborhood that we, we didn't even know whether this exists or not. So you can see they are collaborating with each other. For example, on the Y coordinate, this is the same P, so I save it. But this P is cut or split it into two parts. One is the universal approximation coming from neural network, the purple one. The other is the physical part. So you can see here, the two agents automatically collaborate with each other, which is a nice way. So as a human, I hope they can be intelligent. And now I'm going to talk about the challenge I uh, explained um, previously about the assumption behind the universal approximation. So let me make an example again. This P is uh, power in Phoenix. This is the voltage at MIT. So then when I try to look into the P measurements on the Y coordinate with respect to the voltage at MIT, I find MIT can have different, um, can have the same voltage, but in Phoenix I observe P to be different from day one to day two. So this is in creating an ambiguity. I'm going to talk about the observation or solution, but this is what happens for traditional learning methods. If I have two nodes, right? The input is one, but the output sometimes is one, sometimes it's negative one. Then what is the outcome of um, MLE, like maximum likelihood estimate? This is going to be zero because, you know, maximum likelihood, one, negative one, one, negative one, likely to be zero on average. So this is incorrect. But for power system like the power in Phoenix, we do have our historical load profiles. So this is what we typically call the pseudo measurements in the past. So these profiles will have a low density and also the solar density. If we blindly just ask some maximum likelihood estimate to do the job, it's going to learn something in the middle. It's not matching the profile here. So that is the second idea of this presentation. Keep the uncertainty. Yeah, don't make a decision yet. <laughs> don't, don't just tell this. Just look into the historical data and make a choice later. How to do that? So this is a application of the generative adversary network with a mean square arrow regularization, but I try to tell you the intuition. The idea from last slide is keep the uncertainty according to the distribution, historical data, and then make a choice later. So how do you keep the uncertainty um, according to the distribution? Well, again, it will give you, uh, let me make an example of fake images. So it will collect some true images in the past and learn the distribution like how the hairs are changing from time to time, how the face is um, shifted from one person to the other, but learn the distribution. And then add some noises to a deep neural network. The deep neural, deep neural network is going to create a fake image. At the beginning, it's so ugly and non-natural, but and there's a discriminator to train them to say, hey, you're not like the distribution I, I had in the historical database. Can you make a change? So gradually, this generator will create a fake image that is uh, more or less like a real person. And then this discriminator gives up. Oh, no, okay, I, I do not know whether you are creating the true one or the fake one. So that's the same. Keep it uncertainty. We guide the noise to the generator to generate the P. At the same time, we know there's a physical regulation. Noises in what unit? Power, power or voltage? So here I put the voltage because I know um, I want the voltage to generate the power. On the other hand, for the power in Phoenix, I do have the historical data. It has a shape, like where uh, Phoenix power usually stay for longer time, where Phoenix, I mean, power injection does not uh, have much uh, observation in the past. Based on this, I can make it even better. Remember in my part one, I have the voltage to power as a competition game for two agents, which is the physical knowledge-based agent and the universal approximation-based agent, black box method. So then I can embed that here. So this is a physical embedding of the game. And second, I look into the historical data. Then how do I make a choice later? I use this GAN network to minimize the mismatch according to the historical load profile. So if you're looking into here, this is the competition, the physical part and the virtual part. And after that, I plug them into this HD discrimination to see whether the generated VP relationship matches well with the P in the historical data set. And then I have a confirmation uh, over here. And the result is amazing. Originally, um, I have some other methods 
for example, if I just use the black box method, it's converging relatively fast when compared to um, my method. My method is slow. I mean, version one, uh, eventually it is coming to here. But this new method, because it keeps the uncertainty, at the beginning, it's quite slow. It's not as fast as the other methods, but as you can see, because of the um, uncertain, I mean, keeping the distribution knowledge, when we make the decision, the mean square error eventually get to be lower. So that's a trade-off. If we allow more time for the agent to learn, then we can get good result. And here is an example. If you remember in the past, we say HP dominates when it's fully observable. HP work together with HV, Weighing some of the boundaries, like each person or each agent can do something. In this case, when we are estimating the power at Phoenix based on the voltage at MIT, neural network steps out to say, hey, let me take the job. It's actually some other correlation that the physical law cannot discover. So all of the colors up here are the purple one. For the theoretical guarantees, that's another thing. I work with many utilities. They say, you can try your fancy algorithms here um, offline, but you know, if you want to put it online, then you need to show several visualization, confidence level, physical knowledge, and so that we gradually trust machine learning rule um, from time to time. So this is what I derived. Remember, I have two definitions. One definition is the um, number one for most of our engineering programs, which is the arrow of your estimation or my estimation, the P. The other one is whether the physical knowledge is learned correctly, the G and B. Let's look into the two inequalities. The first one is telling us the sigma is the sensor noise, standard deviation of the sensor noise. The second one is the square root of 2n, n is the degree of the nodes. For example, if my node is connected to three neighbors, then I know this is going to be three. Then there's a square, square root of six. If I only have two neighbors, then I can put it to be two. So then this is square root of four. So that means for the second time, we can embed physical knowledge. For example, engineer tell me in the distribution system, what's the maximum degree for each node? You say three or four at the most, then I can easily plug it in for adaptation. On the other hand, this one over sigma minima, sigma minima is um, the eigenvalue of the data matrix. Uh, what, what does that mean? If you have a data set, that data set is with generation and the loads to be the same all the time. And to me, this is useless because I want data variation so that I can perturb or disturb, or feel what are the other parameters, getting more equations when we are fitting the variables. So this sigma minima, I mean, one over this one is trying to understand how much information is contained in the data that you collected historically. On the other hand, when we do the estimation of the P is the same. It's just, you yeah, have another thing. Once you have the beta, right, you can use the beta to infer the P. So the sigma max is a superposition or maybe multiplication over the um, arrow bound on the left hand side. On the other hand, we can also look into the partial observable case. In the partial observable case, um, our bounds of the power is going to be less than two times. So the variance of the P, which is um, the virtual part of the power minus the variance based on the expectation of PV condition V. Oh, I know it's complex, but just want to tell you over here, this is, is telling us the correlation of the V to P. If there's no correlation, then this term is gone, right? Then the only thing we have is a historical data in Phoenix. But as long as there are some correlations, the two of them can cancel each other to make the uncertainty to be less. So this is how we derive the bound. And yeah, this is an overview of the proof. And the idea is to divide um, all the nodes into two types, which is uh, fully observable part and the partial observable part. The second one is to conquer, uh, use the idea like lifting the space so that it's linear, uh, reduce the correlation. Oh, for here, maybe I can tell you an interesting, interesting story. For voltages, like uh, my voltage at my home and the voltages in my neighborhood, we collect the data. Oh my God, the correlation is so high. It's like, uh, yeah, there's not much information that we can infer. Then we do the lifting space going from V to V I V J. And so such a transformation is reducing the correlation from 0 0.99 to 0 0.43. So this opens the door for many um, machine learning methods like Lasso. If you have a data with 0 0.99 correlation for Lasso, it's, it's nearly impossible to infer useful information. Uh, 
on the, on the other hand, yeah, we can use the yeah, pseudo inverse for yeah, linear regression. We can also use yeah, the GAN idea, which is minimize the distribution differences. Uh, we have the bounds on power. We can look into the waste risk um, distance so that we know yeah, how the two distributions are together. And then we bound the arrow. But the idea is when we generate new data, it should match what historically um, was stored in the original data set. This is the match of the red and the blue. And we have other visualization, how they work together to recover physics. Now I'm going to yeah, the third part, which is the team's work in distribution grid. You may say, Yang, you did some work in topology identification. And do you have any vision? What are the problems or what are the projects? I will talk about four projects that we had from Department of Energy. All of them are current. So yeah, to my understanding, Department of Energy has a lot of um, interest to understand how to use data measures to understand the flow and the control in the system. Before we do data-driven analysis, um, personally, I like to get real data. So I work with many utilities. So this is a data set and that is in Phoenix region. We have more than these, but yeah, um, yeah because of NDA, I, I don't show all the points, but yeah, for me, I actually have all the points that is maybe 100 times denser than what you see here. This is another data set that we have uh, in West Pennsylvania. So you can see, yeah, this is Pittsburgh and the downtown region. This is the airport. And then we have the yeah, data from this downtown region. We also have some other county and small yeah, satellite city region. The project number one I want to talk about and that I took a lead, this is artificial intelligence for robust integration of AMI and PMU data to boost renewable penetration. The idea is in distribution system, our sensors are relatively poor. And can we turn them into virtual micro PMUs? I know it's very aggressive, but that's the idea, right? We have the data, we know some physics. We also have a lot of analysis in state estimation. So then when we have different data coming together, micro PMU, PV, and then can we have a data set that can do data interpolation when we have a slow data stream, interpolate. And when there's a misalignment, can we do the re realignment from time to time? I know we don't have GPS chips on those devices, but maybe you have one or two. Then can we do synchronization by the definition of machine learning? And bad data is always a trouble part, right? There's data quality issue and bad data issue. So we need to remove bad data systematically with some performance guarantees. So in this team, faculty members um, are working. So Mitra and me, we are working on the state estimation. Evangelos and Lin, they are helping us to make the process to be useful rather than academic um, imagination. And Raja Ayana is working with EPE to deploy some control algorithm. This is some prototype we built. The second one is uh, RPRE Open Award. I'm flying to DC um, on March 20th, so next week, to present our yeah, final deliverables. So for here, it's similar. We have the smart meter, the PV, the micro PMU. But the trouble is, how do we do the model when we do not see much? So my role is to do the topology identification. That is the main part of this presentation. I also do the collaboration competition for advanced um, DSSE using deep learning. On the other hand, faculty members like uh, VJ and yeah and uh, you know, other faculty are doing the feeder load DR monitoring, but all of these monitorings are the data driven monitorings with the data coming from APS, Arizona Public Service. And then Nexon Resource Innovation is commercializing this into a super state estimation, I mean, um, version 2.0 method. Finally, of course, with better information, we can do maybe yeah, better economic dispatch or DR operational scheduling. So this is Moji Dash Hedman's job. And finally, um, we do the control. And this is a proto prototype, yeah, right? We try to put the sensor data, then the industrial partners get the GIS information. We do the inference of the connection, they visualize it. The third project that I want to talk about is going from distribution to the transmission with security considered. Yeah, for this work, we say we, we do data analytics, but is the data safe? 
And finally, we do the control, but how is the control going from distribution to the transmission? For this one, we have money around from our state to do data and cleaning from the security perspective. And then Raja Ayana is doing the monitoring. Like in the past, we feel Zoom level control is better. But because of the coupling here and there, in the end, we decided maybe when we have the feeder with a good computer, we should just crunch the data to do the monitoring altogether. For me, I'm doing the hosting capacity, understanding the states so that I know how much solar panels is deployed at different places. Unreal is doing the validation for us. And finally, Qin Lei, who joined Tesla, is doing the inverter control. For this project, um, we go from distribution to the transmission and create software with Hitachi. So over here, you can see there are some different zooms. We try to do the monitoring, and then there are visualization about the outcome of continuous state estimation. We also look into maybe properties so that we can embed different features for learning, like in addition to voltage and power, what else? Finally, we have the hardware deployment. So we design inverters so that we can download um, the learning methods into some hardware to do intelligent control. We use OPRT to do the validation. The last project I want to mention is a Department of Energy project with the Minister of Energy from Israel. This idea is we look into power system, we look into energy system, but can we bring the knowledge from cybersecurity society from, I mean, computer science school so that we can have a joint IT OT design, like information technology and operational technology. For me, I'm a power engineer in operational technology, but is there anything that we can borrow from information technology? So yeah, White House and uh, Israeli government decided to have a consortium like this. So this is our partners. Georgia Tech is our partner in this consortium. SEO make a lot of, makes a lot of donation. GE is on the adver, uh, advisory board. Unreal is um, using its test bed. We send some money to Unreal to do the testing. And there are other companies like energy company, the like US. And public uh, and private utilities to do the data support. It's really companies want to join the market of US. The idea is we have the physical process monitoring, right? We do the IT platform, OT platform, SEO, hardware platform monitoring. Then, you know, for any learning, we need to do data mining. So what is the knowledge base based on different experts from MIT, from Arizona State? So this is what we call the multi-level threat intelligent knowledge database. And third, um, how can we combine the knowledge for people in different domain, IT, OT? Then we do the control. When there's a fault, can we tolerate? Can we recover faster? And finally, we do aim at creating a standard and have educational plan between the two countries. For here, just want to list different tasks like uh, yeah, management, yeah, threat mitigation, malware, and MITRE is helping us to design the standards. We look into the firmware verification. We also do the explainable artificial intelligence. And uh, we try to heal power system automatically. And uh, we also want to have some ICS industrial control system design so that sometimes we don't need to care too much in the OT part. And we do the hardware in the loop validation. And this is architecture, how the US and the Israeli partners are interacting with each other. We have the pilot testing facilities we have the innovation coordination and educational program. We divide into three parts, cybersecurity, energy cyber system, and energy infrastructure. And we have yeah, the six pieces coming together. Open problems. In my opinion, and like what I learned from Maria, and it, it will be nice in the distribution system, there's a plug and play. Yeah, for example, I talk about how I can have two agents to compete with each other for any topology with any information. That is my vision. How do you do the plug and play based on my research? But you know, yeah, there are different problems. Um, can we do the monitoring in other parts? Like maybe there's a gas system. On the other hand, I talk about monitor. How about the control, right? For the control, we also have some ideas, which is about reinforcement learning twin. Try to identify the physics to iteratively improve the control strategy. The second problem for, for me is I talk to utilities. But sometimes the data quality is really bad, preventing me to do you know, further analysis. So that is the idea. We have good data sets. Can we do the transfer learning from maybe the old, where encrypted power grid to a new grid that has no sensor yet, or to a different grid that doesn't have a good 
sensor infrastructure. So this is transfer learning. And here I show the power grid, how we can do abstraction, property identification, where are the generators, loads, do the structural alignment, how do they align together, right? Loads to the yeah, generation, finally do the reduction. What's the core piece so that you can transfer? It's not anything can be transferred to anything else. On the other hand, um, when we talk about distribution grid, we always care about the privacy and the you know, customers are the priority in my opinion. So how do we use the IT and OT to do some joint defense so that when we are using the data for monitoring and control, when we use the data to transfer the knowledge, we are sure we are transferring something useful and not illegal. And finally, you know, I talked to some folks at CMU, uh, I think last week, and there's a yeah, increasing concern in the distribution system. People has new technology, like I propose one. Other people deploy it. But what is the policy guidance, right? What what is privacy by definition? If this is too strict, nobody is going to share the data. And what is data driven analysis? What is the goal, right? What is the performance guarantee? Is it Yang try to prove from one utility to the other? Then Yang is successful. Probably not. We need some policy to define how to have a standard. I mean in this work. So that's why I feel MIT and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also working for HWP as big data webinars and the consortium can maybe work together to have policy guidance. And that's the end. Thank you so much for, for the time. Daniel, back to you. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Yang, for that presentation. Um, we do have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions. Um, um, I know Maria is probably itching to uh, ask some questions. If uh, <laughs> also had questions, if you drop them in the chat. Maybe we can go in order. Uh, uh, just do the chat first. Th there are not, there's no, none in the chat right now. Okay. So, Yang, it sounds like you can do anything you want or there are really tough questions that you don't know how to do in for distribution grids. Right, yeah, they are, if I understand correctly, you are asking me, you know, what, what are the challenges, right? So um, in the distribution grid, one challenge is the data quality. Yeah, for example, uh, I remember when I was at CMU, you know, I got some PMU data, 90% of them are the yeah, bad data. Yeah. Now it's improving. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the same nowadays. When we get the data from the utilities, many of the sensors, we, we don't have good data quality. Yeah, for example, the resolution is bad. It's not synchronized. Sometimes they even have the bad uh, ID number. So we work for quite a while to find the meter ID is wrong. So yeah, so this is number one challenge. Number two challenge is when I have an algorithm, I think it's very good. I validated with my partner, but it's very hard to convince utilities to use it. They are very conservative. So yeah, the second challenge is, is there a sustainable way? I mean, academic and industrial people can work together to do some tutorials or to convince them to have maybe some new, uh, I, I don't know, field deployment. So everybody can see the, the magic and the contribution. The third one that I feel and to be quite challenging is um, nowadays, um, I mean, at least from university side, um, many faculty members are publishing papers with AI applied to power. Um, I feel um, it's good. However, my utility partners told me they don't look into those papers. So how can we have some general guidance so that one, we have good criteria so people work towards maybe three or four directions and systematically, and two, the utilities will pay attention to our innovation so those are three challenges I feel yeah, to be very hard, Maria. Okay, so I wanted to introduce actually Sylvie Koziel, who is our visitor from KTH. Nice. The, inviting, you, inviting you to give this talk is in part uh, you know, motivated by a lot of discussions that she and I had. So Sylvie, mm -hmm. want to just say a little bit what you are trying to do and mm -hmm. where are you stuck? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just have two minutes, I guess. <laughs> no, no, you have time. Uh, so, hi, my name is Sylvie. So, I'm a visiting student from KTH in Sweden. Yes. And um, I, I'm working on, on data and distribution systems. And what uh, we are trying to work on with Maria is uh, trying yeah. to see, um, like, the minimum data amount that is needed in distribution system 
Um, knowing that there will be like challenges like uh, PV and EV in the distribution system. So um, what I see in the literature is like uh, many use um, many kind of data and also uh, PMUs. Um, and so uh, from my perspective, I'm wondering whether that's not an overkill for, for DSOs that just, you know, maybe they don't need all that. Um, Data. So we are trying to <laughs> to see what, what what would be actually needed, um, and not to produce too much data. So that's uh, yeah, the the big <laughs> uh, but problem. But I think that I, if I can just add, yeah. I think the idea of having some projections for EV deployment or PV is EV is not being controlled, just get on the system or PV is and ensuring that there is no operating problem on distribution grid. So how some of these tools that you were talking about could be used to tackle something like that? Yeah. So like yeah. voltage deviations, overloads, these kind of things that might happen with increased penetration mm -hmm. of PV and EVs. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, um, if I understand correctly, the question is, um, when we look into those data, um, how can we identify the trouble with the utility agreement, and then how can we show that we can resolve the issue? Is that the question? Yes, and right. mm -hmm. if you need to add new equipment or something, what equipment you should add to actually ah, accommodate? Right, right. Yeah, because yeah. we're starting, like the baseline is the actual state of the data. Right, mm -hmm. so we are considering what is actually there, and we try to see what would be needed in the future or what do we need to install now uh, so, so that we can avoid these future problems? Right. Yeah, to me, I'm sorry about the answer, but that depends on yeah, which utility um, we are working with. Yeah, for example, yeah, for some utilities, they, they do have very good um, system. They have big batteries, they have reactive power controllers um, at different locations. But if you just ask me what, what to be put there, I will say, number one, this is going to be um, maybe the batteries that is most needed. And second, um, the controllers, the yeah, reactive power controllers, because I'm working mostly towards um, this like a uh, voltage data. So that is one thing that um, I will say, for example, I, I was working with one utility in, in California. So there we see the voltage fluctuation to go beyond 10% yeah, from time to time. So typically you have a yeah, power quality requirement, but at that place, this is really created by increasing solar generations in yeah, some regions near the yeah, coast. So in that case, uh, reactive power controller is definitely needed. So yeah, on the other hand, when we when I work with utilities, sometimes I need to align with their scope, right? So sometimes they just want to deploy sensors. Then I I work with them to see what sensors um, to purchase and what are the maybe data analytics they can obtain. It's not that I tell them, hey, put some yeah, inverters, put 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 the Eaton sensors there, they will follow me. Sometimes they even have the projects which is to use laser information to identify the topology. Then I need to compete with that too. So that will cost them $2 million. I will say, give me 200 bucks. Uh, no, 200K. I will try to maybe do some easy data crunching for you to see the topology. And to summarize, I will say, um, to me, the yeah, voltage fluctuation is really a troublesome part when people are putting solar panels um, there. And second, batteries is very important as um, the EV charging stations are yeah, growing very dramatically. And the third, um, sometimes I, I, I need to talk to the utilities to align my scope with their scope, different utilities that do have different needs. Yeah, if I can follow up on that. So oh. just to connect the dots, like, um, mm -hmm. is there a way based on these patterns that you learn to mm -hmm. actually tell utility where to put the, at what location in the grid to put uh -huh. uh, to put reactive power control or voltage controller, uh, put it at that location rather than the other. But the setting is the same. I have yeah. some observable nodes already. I don't have some, but I'm learning these patterns. Mm -hmm. So almost looks like 
mm-hmm. depending on where the problem is, you have to learn different patterns with AI and right. then uh, mm-hmm. then answer the question. So it's sort of how do you do it for the entire network, I guess. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, we have several projects. Which what well, number one is sensor placement. So where to put, um, for example, some micro PMU. Where to just put some uh, AMI sensor. So utility. Um, I remember one utility that just want to buy 10k sensors, but there are too many places. So we help them to identify. Um, and second is how where to you, place. The- how do you do that? How do you do that? Right. So when we look into where to place the sensor, we talk to the utilities to understand their needs. For example, when they did the investment, what they want, and sometimes they want maybe some stability analysis in a better way. Then we have some algorithm to put the sensors at maybe critical place like the boundaries and near some generators. We need to adapt our algorithm. And second, and sometimes they just want to maybe have better visibility into the network. Then we try to look into observability as a metric. And sometimes they just have a bunch of sensor. They, they, they don't know where to place them or they don't have a good idea. Then we give them some instruction like this can maybe help you understand better the power quality. This can help you understand better the topology. So yeah, because my work is project driven. So that's what I want to provide here. Storage is expensive. So how do you do this to minimize the storage needed? I think that's, I would put that as a challenge problem. Whatever right. methods yeah. you develop, whatever methods Sylvie does, at the end, you want the customers to pay the least, right? Yeah, exactly. And still get served. So minimizing the storage, which is batteries, which are really the most expensive part. I mm-hmm. think that that could be one one subject to discuss for future collaboration, you know, because we have some, not AI, but just sort of mm-hmm. um, physics-based, mathematical optimization-based approaches to detect right. where to put, you know, if you increase like PVs by 10%, you know, there will be some voltage problems with his, mixing with his ter- historic data. And then mm-hmm. the methods that I think Sylvie and I are working on and her advisor there in Sweden mm-hmm. is how um, how do you determine for the next year, it's sort of like dynamic investment, how much to put and where so that if mm-hmm. 10% of TVs come on the system, you don't have the problem. And that sort of rolls into the future. And once you have it that you use it in operations in an automated way and does some good. So combining, I I still cannot figure out in real time here, but combining those methods, those approaches with more of the data enabled learning that you are talking about, I think it would be very sort of fruitful thing to tackle because you don't have clean data either and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. So AI and machine learning would help, but on the other hand, um, I think that you need more um, mathematical optimization, physics-based methods to decide where the points, mm-hmm. pain points are, you know, rather yeah. than just looking at the patterns. Can the pattern tell you mm-hmm. where, is the, where is the pain point going to be having all this historic data? So maybe we follow up. I think this is almost the time to um, stop uh, formal presentation, but um, I'll send. We'll send you an email and maybe follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Are there you any know, yeah. questions in the chat? Yes, I think there's one. one yeah, and can you just hold on a little more? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. If you want to, uh, come off you and ask your question. Right. I see an online question. Ray Beach said, uh, if we could better know the network parameters, specifically the lines, and we can also do better estimate of the thermal violations on the network, how could that benefit uh, your technology? I guess that technology is, um, is meaning the topology identification or the flow. And to answer that question, if we know the network parameters, that is very nice. So that means we have more data from historical database or from maybe this additional knowledge, then what we can do is we do regularization. For example, let's say I try to identify a line, uh, whether it's connected or not. I try to identify maybe how, what is the GMB values on the line? 
if there's a good knowledge about those parameters, then I can put a regularization to say, hey, most likely this is the parameter. So when I'm trying to do the recalibration, then the learners should not go too far away. So that is how the network parameters can help my analysis. And second, and if there's a better estimate of the thermal variation, and that is also very important because when we do the estimation, uh, we have limited constraints. So this thermal variation, um, I mean, range can also help us to narrow down the search space. For example, in, in the original case, I searched in 1,000 dimensional space, but maybe this um, variational range can narrow down to 500. So that's a significant speed up, um, making my analysis more like a real-time analysis. So that's my answer to Rain Beach. Thank you. That answer, or you want to comment more? Oh, me? Yeah, that, that is my no, answer. No, no, I'm wondering oh, if Ray wants to Yeah, say sure. That. Yeah. No, that, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No, that, that was, that was very good. I, so, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Yang. Thank you for taking time on a sh relatively short notice and you got get us going. So next Monday, there will be another presentation and so forth. So you'll get the invitation. Thank you all. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone for attending. Nice to meet you. Bye.